I am Professor Takayama, and thank you for joining us again today for 2020 Invited Lecture Towards Critical Historical and Transnational Dialogues on Japanese Model of Education, hosted by Global Education Office, Graduate School of Education, Kyoto University. Thank you very much for coming. And I am head of the Global Office, and I am pleased to be the moderator once again, this time following the last one. So talking about topic, this is about and education and colonial rules. So this is a part of a lecture series and we have nine lectures uh, planned for this year. So let me try to explain why we chose this topic. So this lecture series was started with the aim of reviewing Japanese style of education. And there is a uh, Age Port Nippon. This is a private and government co a collaboration of the Ministry of Education of Japan. They are promoting the Japanese style education, but in order to understand the Japanese style education from our experience of a border, border crossing, this uh, lecture series was started. And in the first lecture, Amira Shimabukuro of the University of Seattle spoke about the experiences of Japanese Americans in concentration camps during the World War II. Especially, she talked about the concept of gaman that was found in the diaries, as the uh, professor Shimabukuro explained. But this time, the topic will be on education. The focus of today's talk will be on education during Japanese colonial rule in Taiwan and Korea on the other side of the Pacific at the beginning of the 20th century. That is 20 or 30 years before the concentration camps in the US. So today, Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports and Science and Technology is actively promoting Japanese educational practice abroad, especially in the form of educational assistance for developing countries. But um, Japan's colonial education in Taiwan and Korea is another example of Japan's overseas expansion of education. Furthermore, there are two similarities between these two cases. The first, both the colonial education and today's overseas deployment of Japanese style education in the form of international assistance in Egypt are, in a sense, acts of goodwill to help those in need. The premise of these good intentions is that we, as providers of assistance, are ahead of them and that we are reaching out to those who are lagging behind. So it assumes a kind of timeline in which we are the future and they are in the past. And of course, I am not suggesting that what the MEXT is trying to do today is the same as educational um, education under colonial rules in the past. Its political and geopolitical intentions are clearly different, but whether it is the civilizational progress of the colonial era or the development of today, it is based on a relationship based on a linear time frame. So there's an actor who provides assistance and also the subject to receive an assistance. That relationship could be fixated. It may make it difficult to reflect on the act. And the second common denominator is that there is some kind of unequal power relationship intervening in this process of development of Japanese style education in other countries. Under colonial rule, Japanese style education was introduced by force and with overwhelming military power. Similarly, the political and economic imbalance between Japan and Egypt or Vietnam is one of the reasons why Japanese style education, for example, 
Tokkatsu has been introduced to Egypt and Japanese style physical education and musical instruments such as recorder have been introduced to Vietnam. And in Vietnam, especially in manufacturing industry, there are many Japanese companies in Vietnam. So they have a great impact on the economy of Vietnam. However, um, I don't want to make a hasty judgment that all this is bad just because it is accompanied by a certain type of violence. In fact, things are complicated. And some people welcome the Japanese style education introduced as part of the colonial rule as civilizing Taiwan and Korea. While others welcome the Japanese style physical and instrumental education as contributing to the quality of education in those countries. And as Dr. Hura will speak about, after the liberation of Japanese rule, that um, education under colonial rule was succeeded after liberation. And also, the Japanese style education, especially physical education, as well as music in education, are, are welcomed by some part of the Vietnam to contribute in the quality of education in Vietnam. So when I'm looking for someone who was doing methodical historical research on the multifaceted aspect, complexities, and antagonistic power relationship of education under colonial rule, I happened to come across a book written in 2013 by today's speaker, Dr. Satoko Hiura, in the library of our school, titled Shrines, Schools, and Colonies, Reverse Refunctioning Japanese Rule of Korea published by Kyoto University Press. And I was very interested in having her to speak with us. I later learned that Dr. Hiura was a graduate of our school. And Professor Hiura and I didn't know each other at all, but she answered my abrupt request without any hesitation, and I'm very grateful to her. And Dr. Hiura, in 20. 11 and doctorate at our school and she worked as a full-time lecturer at the Faculty of Science and Technology Taking University for about four years. She then moved to the National Museum of Japanese History in Chiba Prefecture where she is now an associate professor. Today she will talk about intended break and unexpected continuation found through the analysis of school documents of Taiwan and Korea in 1945. Now Dr. Hugh the floor is yours. Now let me start. As has been introduced, I'm from National Museum of Japanese History. My name is Satoko Hira. And thank you very much for joining this lecture today. I understand that many of you are participating today. Due to unexpected situation of the society, we couldn't provide lecture in person, so it was organized on Zoom platform today. As a person who deliver a lecture on online platform, it's sometimes very problematic because I can't see the facial expressions or body languages of the audience because I can't see you or I can't feel you. Because usually, when I deliver a lecture, I readjust my lecture, responding to the audience. So I thought it might be a problem. However, there is a bright side as well. There is a big potential as well. The light might be small, but I think still there is a very bright light on the online lecture because people from overseas can participate in this lecture. And even if people are living in Japan, 
people who don't have access to the lecture hall can participate as well. The other day, I was one of the audience of History Study Association. There was an online symposium. And there was a high school student participating in the session. And that was possible because it was online. So there is positive side. And today, I want to look at the positive side of the online seminar. Today, I prepared some slides. I have 13 pages of slides in total and some additions. Now, let's start the lecture. As a researcher, I'm interested in the modern imperial system and schools under Japanese colonial rule. My interest lies in how imperial government built schools in colonies and how it indoctrinated students with the emperor's divinity and associated myth. In the autumn of 2014, I went to visit an elementary school in southern Taiwan to see how they were restoring and preserving a building called Ho An Den, which means Hall of Enlightenment, which was built for Japanese schools and used to store photos of the emperor and the empress. Taiwanese school were now restoring that building, the building which was used to store emperor's photos. And it was very interesting to see the building, but it, what was even more interesting was the Journal of Official History of Schools. Of course, it was written in Japanese. The school staff showed me the Journal of Official History, and that was very interesting. And because of this, we've conducted all these researches shown here. The next slide. This is about Journal of Official History as school documents. According to the school education law, which is the most basic law in modern Japanese school education, every school has to have a student register and attendance record. According to this law, there are certain documents that each school has to have. And that documents include student register and attendance record. So reg student register and attendance record of students have to be stored in schools according to the law. Those people who want to be te want to be teachers have to remember all the things. They have to remember what have to be stored at schools. The pre-war system was similarly structured with the elementary school regulations requiring a student register and attendance record. So this is the most important law and this law requires student register and attendance record. However, School journals, which I'm going to talk about today, 
were not required by the law. However, if you look around Japan, you will find many cases where school journals from before the war period are still stored in the safe in the principal's office. Those journals are still stored in many schools. Take a look at this picture at the right. This is an example from a school in Chiba Prefecture. It says school journal and this has been there from Meiji era and on the first page it says it has to be permanently stored. So journals are not mentioned in the Japanese law. However, those journals are very important for each school and they have to store uh, those journals permanently. So those are very important things for schools. So this is to keep the record. And they had started keeping school journals in Japan in the 1880s. And more and more schools started keeping the journals. And in that process, we had um, wars. Uh, we colonized Taiwan in 1895 and annexed Korea in 1910. And the process of expansion of the school journals were introduced in those colonies as well. The same things happened in colonies. And it's often the case that local municipalities made it mandatory to have school journals. They were prefectural governments in Japan and Taiwan and provincial governments in Korea and the Japanese rule. So school journals are not mandatory according to the Japanese law or the bigger law. However, it's mentioned in the regulations at the school levels. So even if there is no regulation at the municipal government's level, if you look at the school bylaws, there are detailed descriptions of what to write in those school journals. After the colonization of Taiwan in 1895, public schools for primary education were established in Taiwan. They were called public schools. They were different type of schools from the schools built for Japanese people who went to live in Taiwan. However, as to what documents should be placed in schools following the situation in Japan at that time, a school journals were not specified in a major law in Taiwan, but according to a prior research, local government started to request school journals and later, Taiwan general government issued instructions to have journals to entire Taiwan. Instruction is a simpler version of law. So this simpler version instruction requested to have school journals in Taiwan. In this example, in the slide, as to the documents school have to have, you can find school journals following student register and teachers registers and their CVs. So that was an example from Taiwan. What about Korea, which was annexed in 1910?
in Korea for elementary education, general schools were established. They were Japanese equivalent of primary schools and Taiwanese equivalent of public schools. They were established based on Korean education order, which was the biggest law and was Japanese equivalent of education order of 1900. Just like the ordinance for enforcement of the education order was introduced in Japan, the Korean regulations for general schools were issued in Korea. And the first bullet point is the school regulations. However, the word school journal is not mentioned. But if you look at the following bullet point, there is a word which reads school journals. And there is also bylaws. Oh, for according to Ordinance for Enforcement Education Order, uh, here is the word school journals. But I don't know if this was issued in all 13 provincial governments, but I only confirmed that it was issued in Pusan. It says school journals as the first documents to have. And it also says that school journals have to be stored permanently. Now, if you look at even lower level of regulation, this is bylaw of Sansu General School in Pyongyang, which is today's North Korea. There is a detailed description of requirements on school journals. The entire chapter is dedicated to the requirement about the school journals. School trip, medical health check, and performance, all those things have to be kept in the school journals. And the contents are almost same as school journals from other uh, areas. So I found the bylaw only from this school, but I guess that many other schools also have this had this kind of bylaws. Why is it that there are more detailed description about requirement as you go down from national laws, regulations, instructions, and to school bylaws? Why there is such a detailed description in bylaws at each school, but not in the national law? I can only speculate, but my hypothesis is this. I think rather than national government, Local governments or local communities needed school journals more, probably to maintain a sense of unity and identity by passing down their common history and experience to the next generation. The common history and the common school events and the names of the graduates, those experiences they want to pass down to the next generation to keep the sense of unity and also to maintain their identity. That's my speculation. I think that's why there are a lot of detailed description about school journals in bylaws of each school. In the case of Japan, more and more schools started school journals in the 1890s, which coincide with the introduction of the township system. Township system is a municipal mergers. So it stays equivalent of municipal mergers. In Meiji era, 
there was the same kind of big scale municipal mergers. I assume that many people thought that municipal mergers would destroy the identity of their villages. That's why they wanted to create school journals. It may sound like an exaggeration, but schools are not always doing things only by following instructions from the national government. Rather, they are driven by their own wishes, desires, and interests. The next slide. And this is about 1945 school documents. As I mentioned at the beginning, my research interests lie in the modern emperor system and schools. The system is symbolized by the picture of the emperor and empress known as the Goshin A. It was a very important duty for schools to protect the picture before the war or after Meiji era or since the Meiji era. Protection of the picture of the emperor and empress was very important. And this act of protection was called Hogo, Hoei or Hoan. These words all mean the protection of the picture of emperor and empress. Here is an example from Yanbetsu Elementary School in Hokkaido. This is an entry of school journal in 1946. The location of Yanbetsu is shown with a star mark in the Hokkaido map at the lower right. Yanbetsu belonged to the Abashiri Administrative District. The page on the right is January 12, 1945. Excuse me, January 13, 1945, Saturday. And the page on the left is also 1946, January 12. It's also Saturday. The reason those two pages are at side by side is that paper was scarce during the war because the government controlled the supply. So after using the 1945 sheet for one year, they hand wrote the columns on the blank back side of the sheet and entered the year 1946 as you can see at the first asterisk. Both left side, left page and right page, I indicated small square. And here it says Ho A Jokyo, it means the status of the pictures. In 1945 it's pre-printed. This is to write about the situation of the picture. Teacher wrote the situation of the status of the pictures every day. In 1945 and 1946, although there is August 15, 1945, it says that the picture is in intact condition. So, the teachers had to check the situation of the picture and wrote down the situation or the status of the picture. However, if you look at January 12, 1946, this is after the war. If you look at the area indicated in red square, here it says go ho ho. This means the picture has now been respectively wrapped. So they wrapped the pictures of emperor and empress. Emperor and empress of 
Showa era and also Taisho era were wrapped according to this diary. Now page 8 of the slide. This is the continue from the previous slide. So the reason why they were wrapped on January 12th is because on January, as you can see to the right, in 1946, January 13, on Sunday, it is, it is written that uh, they were returned to Koshimizuko, as you can see in the red box. Hosem means that the respect we return. Those pictures were respect we returned. So as you can see in these entries, those pictures were returned. So it is presumed that all the pictures held by schools in the areas were collected into larger schools in the area, then gathered into the Abashiri branch office of Hokkaido Prefecture Government, then into the head office of Hokkaido Prefecture Government in Sapporo, then finally moved to Tokyo. And at that time, the emperor in the picture was dressed as a soldier as the leader who pressed forward the walls. And these photos were collected from schools all over the country and the guides of replacing them with pictures of emperor without military gear. But in the end, no new pictures were distributed. So it is worth noting that um, the small uh, red box, handwritten small six, Hoei Jokyo status of protection of the picture. So from January 13th, there was a sudden absence of any entry into the status of protection of the pictures. So before this day, the pictures were preserved or protected, but the pictures were returned back, therefore, there are no pictures to protect. Therefore, there was no entry. But then, on January 17th, somehow the entry was restored once again, saying that there's no abnormalities on the pictures. So, this is an entry um, made by teachers maybe just out of a habit. So one, once one teacher makes an entry, then the following day, another teacher makes an entry. So this is, was kind of the a habit entering into these boxes in the school journal. So that is the situation of the pre-war and also wartime system that However, that was gone, that disappeared as the customary entries entirely disappeared after sporadic entries. On the other hand, in liberated Korea or Korean Peninsula, there is a school journal written in the way shown in the slide in the middle of the pictures on the right. It starts with the donkey or tangi in Korean language. So it starts with the uh, Korean calendar. So dankun, dan, uh, tangi is a local year counting system or a local calendar which originated in the year when the dangun, the founder of Korea, was enthroned. And it is a traditional way of counting years in Korean peninsula. So the year counting was changed. So it say the year of 4,278. So it is equivalent to the 1945. And if you look at the Chinese characters, it say that uh, the copy 
of the imperial rescript on education was incinerated. And it's a hajat in Korean language. And hajat corresponds to as soon as. So something happened right after. So here it's a haja. Haja means as soon as in Korean language. Because Japan was defeated. So as soon as Japan was defeated, the imperial rescript uh, on education was incinerated right after. So it says that the imperial rescript on education was incinerated as soon as Japan was defeated. And to the left, it says 1945. It's the 25th year of Showa Emperor, but in the middle, It says that the school had been aiming for physical fitness and complete victory in the war as their top objectives. But then next year, in the year of the 4278, that is 1946, so what is noted here is that in the next line, Without changing paper, without changing form, in just in the next line, say that then this school suddenly adapted the Hongik as their top objective in the following year. That the Hongki is often used in the context of Korean history as a word from the Korean classic, which is also used in the Korean basic law of education and hongik means helping others greatly so just next line that school dramatically transformed into a totally different school and in hokkaido the school had protected the pictures of emperors and empress but uh, the primary schools in colonial Korean Taiwan did not have pictures of the emperor and empress, except in special cases. Therefore, the imperial rescript on education is the most symbolic of Japan and emperor. So here is say Chiu Se Nando. It's in around twelve left in the middle of the Korean Peninsula. So here. In this school, according to school journal in 1930, that it received the rescript of education and its place in office. Then, next line say it was insinulated. And there is a double line for correction. And it says a raising that shows the wish of the people who wrote this. They wanted to erase this line. And next slide, page 10. So let me give you another example from a school, Journal of General School in Colonial Korea. The school receive a copy of the Imperial Rescript on Education in 1923 and to the right this is actually cut in the middle to the right in the picture it says we are honored to receive the Imperial Rescript on Education but after the liberation if you can see to the left it was written simply in pencil. It was incinerated immediately. So harm in Korean is su in Japanese. So it simply says it was incinerated. In Japan, pictures of emperor and empress were very carefully treated as we have seen in the school 
journals of the primary school in Hokkaido, they were respectfully wrapped and respectfully retained, and also for the imperial rescript. On education, it took some time for Diet to decide in 1948 that imperial edict or imperial decree, such as imperial rescript on education, were invalid. But in the colonies, immediately after liberation, as a matter of course, they were erased without any resolution at assemblies or without any respectfully returning them. Now let me move on to the page 11 of the slide. So it's a continuation change of the school journal. So in school journal, in the school of colonies, here are some changes between before and after liberation. I think they intentionally changed. First of all, the color of ink was often changed. In around 1940, they used a black ink. Before that, they black a brush to make an entry into the school journal. But after liberation, they started to use the blue ink. And the left hand, this is a school from Taiwan. This is still um, kept in this school. And to the right, this is a photo of school journal from a Korean school. So the ink is changed, as you can see. And also, what is more noteworthy is that um, if you pay attention to things which are written in the uh, blue ink, the year to be used was also changed from Japanese calendar to Tanki calendar or Taiwanese local calendar or Mingguo or Western calendar for the picture to the left it's a name of cities mentioned here Shoka so in the middle to the left it's a years 34 this is the Taiwanese local calendar of Mingguo. The revolution was the first year of Taiwanese local calendar of Mingguo. So they change from the year counting system from Japanese one to Taiwanese one. So, so why these changes were made? It seems that the role of school journal is not to serve the nation but to wave our history. It is necessary too for identity formation. So when the line of we change, so from where to where is us, when the line of we, when the boundary of we changes, there were things to be changed naturally, but there are things that needs to be changed. So that is my speculation on this. So moving on to the next slide. There are something that I wonder. So in school journals, or schools in the colonies, here are some changes before and after liberation. But then there are some times when I find myself wondering why did the format in which the words were printed in Japanese continued to be used in the two schools which had incinerated the imperial rescript on education. Perhaps this is a theme for the next lecture series, but I think it is a good demonstration of the added addictive or customary nature of the act of writing. So I think there was an unconscious understanding that an act of writing itself was something universal that could be shared by them and us. So it, whether it was them or us to do writing, the act of writing itself is universal. So I think it can be said that an act of continuing to write was recognized as necessary for the formation of our identity for them. So incidentally, 
this style of writing, vertical writing mixed with Chinese characters, was continued in many schools in Korea until 1970s. But even in 90s or even into the 2000s. Now, this format of school journal has dramatically changed in Korea and very basic items are written in Hangul script and can be found in the principal's office. So now these are colonial school journals that I talked about are now preserved in the National Archives of Korea, organization similar to the National Archives of Japan, and they are now digitally published as historical documents. So anybody can access these documents, even from Japan. Moving on to the next slide. So when we think about a globalization of so-called Japanese style of education, tokatsu, tokubetsu, or katsudo, the Japanese educational model of holistic education is a foothold for us. At uh, my previous uh, duty, I was involved in tokatsu, and I looked at government guidelines of education. And if you look at the um, explanations for the ceremonial events at schools in the current government guidelines of education, so as you can see in this slide, the one of the major points of the tokatsu is school events, among which ceremonial events play a very important role in tokatsu. And just explain the purpose of tokatsu. And as you can see, the underlined area. I think you will understand what are focus in the government of government guidelines of education about the tokatsu. So I think emphasis is again on solemnity, discipline, and the rules. In 1946, primary school in Yambes, Hokkaido, the picture of emperor and empress was respectfully wrapped and returned. But then as to what they were using the pictures for, it was for a school ceremony to pay respect to the emperor. So the picture was used to pay respect to the emperor around that time. That's why those pictures were carefully managed and protected. So the handling of the picture at the Yambits Elementary School was very solemn, I believe. So while there's no such things as bowing to the pictures of Emperor or Empress in the current school ceremonies in Japan, but only solemn mood seem to be actively maintained currently in Japan. So this is the last slide that I have, but if I have time, I have three more slides, so if time allows, I can continue. So let me continue. I just want to talk about what we can learn from these school journals. So left hand side, this is a ch chosen uh, public school in Taiwan. So this is a document from public school in Taiwan. In wartime of Japan, there is a school inspector called the Shigaku. And those inspectors just went around schools to make inspections. And as you can see, the school inspector inspector corrected some information from above in red ink. And it say in the middle, as AJF needs national, but it's um actually single line and change as a in imperial Japanese citizen from Japanese citizen. So this is a correction 
by the school inspector. So they pay such a subtle attention to the writings on the school journal. And 2014, as I said, I went to Taiwan, Tainan or the Taiwan, and this is a Ho Wanden that is still preserved in uh, elementary school of Taiwan. And I have three more slides. So I'll cover these additional three slides before I close. So please look at the pictures. These are school journals from Chokaku Elementary School of Hokkaido. These entries are made by teachers in shift. In 1946, it says January 26. That is the photo of the right. And January 28th is the picture to the left. And photos on the right. In the red box, it say the Koshinye, the picture of Emperor and Empress. It said there's no abnormality on the picture of Emperor and Empress. And if you go to the left, this is the entry of January 28th. It say that the pictures were sent back to the a local office. And here also it said that those uh, pictures were returned to a local government. And then the very polite expression was gone after the war time. And this is a picture of a school journal found in Korea. This is an example post um, school journal of the post-war period after the Korean War. So they still use the same format many years after the World War II. And here once again it's Tangi year 4296. But then from the following year it's say 96.4. So they change from the Dunkey year counting to Western calendar. And also 1979, well, this format was used until 1979. And if you look at the entries into the journal, those are very similar to what are written during wartime. For example, a clock was installed, a school gate was newly installed. So these items, very simple items, were recorded in this journal. So when Pak Chung took an office around that time, I believe, but then they still and keep writing those are school journals. And Tanki year was used up until 1960s and 1970s. But after that, they changed over to the Western calendar. But still, a Tanki year appears on the calendar. If you see or watch a Korean drama, it says both the Western calendar and tanki calendars. So please pay attention to it when you watch the Korean TV drama next time. Okay, next one will be the last slide. So I intentionally made this slide small because this is unsensitive information. This contains the personal information. That's why I intentionally uh, make it invisible. I don't want to you to see this um, in detail, but then um, this is part of the school journal of a school in Korea. In the journal, there's always a list of teachers who took 
an office and also who quit and who were transferred. So this is a page of the recording of teachers who are newly unappointed or who are transferred and who also quit. And you see the names in around 1941 or onward. Those are the teachers who quit after 1941. So their names are double lined and to the left. That the Japanese style names were added to the left of the original uh, Korean names because of the Soshi Kaimei. From that time, the um, Korean names were changed to Japanese names. And after the revelation, as I said, the format continued to be used in Korea. And this paper contained information of the teacher who uh, quit on December 31st, 1945. So teachers who were appointed with Japanese names were also changed to the Korean original names. So for the case of the teachers who are newly appointed to this school with Japanese name, in this case, the Japanese name to the left of Japanese name without double line that the original name was added. So as we saw, First, uh, they were forced to change their name into Japanese names, and then they changed back to the Korean name once again after liberation, and double lined or without double line. So anyway, those are the changes that are made on the teacher's name that may be demonstrating some abusive nature, violent nature of the Japanese rule. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much.